Um, okay, so this video is devoted to discussing um, the appropriateness of using Nash equilibrium as solution concept under the assumption of risk aversion and explaining how rationalizability can help to achieve Nash equilibrium. So please look at this table and tell if you were a column player whether you would choose up or rather down. If you have the same degree of risk aversion as the majority of people do, then probably you would choose up instead of down. Now let's analyze it formally. Um, okay, so obviously the column player has a dominant strategy which is left like regardless of uh, the role player's decision it's more appropriate to choose left because then it will give column player 10 instead of 9.9 .9, and again 10 instead of 9.9 .9 if the role players choose down um, so in this case for the rose player choosing down is the most, you know, rational strategy because thanks to this, role player can get 10 instead of 9. Like, the main problem regarding this is that, you know, although down left is a Nash equilibrium, so if this game is played simultaneously, uh, rational row a column player would end up here. Like, in reality, the outcome of this game was here, up left. So, you know, this is the problem. Because the idea behind Nash Equilibrium is that outcome predicted by Nash Equilibrium can serve as good approximation for game solution in real life. However, you know, if this assumption is violated, maybe Nash Equilibrium is not appropriate at all. Maybe there should be a different solution concept. And the role player would choose up instead of down simply because this option is less risky, you know? Like, take a look. Um, if the second player is indeed a rational player, uh, aware of the structure of this game, then, you know, choosing up instead of down, role player gets 9 instead of 10. Like, effectively, role player will lose one point. However, you know, if the column player is, um, if the column player turns out to be irrational, you know, or the column player is not completely aware of the structure of this game, and the left player decides to choose right, even though it's a dominated strategy, then the role player will get 1000, uh, sorry, will get 8 uh, instead of minus 1000 if the role player sticks to strategy up. So again, here, um, under best case scenario, uh, and if it turns out that the column player is indeed rational and aware of the structure of this game, by choosing down, uh, by choosing up, sorry, uh, role player will lose one unit which is a pity, but, you know, nevertheless. In this case, if uh, the, call, the role player decides to stick to optimal, you know, Nash equilibrium strategy and chooses down, assuming that the column player is perfectly rational and will always choose left, like, the role player has a chance to lose 1,000 instead of getting 8 if it turns out that column player is... For, if it turns out that for some reason column player decides to choose right. So this is the idea, you know, again, as I mentioned before, this should be, this is the Nash equilibrium and this should be solution of this game. However, in real life we end up with this solution of this game, you know, so probably the status of Nash equilibrium is kind of questionable. Maybe we shouldn't use Nash equilibrium as the game solution concept. Um, however, you know, it's not that obvious. So the problem I described above is a bit simplified. 
you know. So the problem discussed above was solved under pure strategies, like assuming uh, pure strategies. Uh, so the column player can choose either left or right and we can analyze what will happen you know if we assume that there is some probability at least that the column player will choose right so let's say that column player will choose left with probability p and right with probability 1 minus p so again in this case we violate this assumption about full determination so column player chooses either left or right we allow for mixing and this will allow us analyzing whether you know choosing up is indeed such an irrational option for the role player okay so under this assumption here is the expected payoff associated with choosing strategy up and this is the expected payoff associated with choosing strategy down. So if we assume, like if, you, if we want to calculate the value of P, uh, which would explain why actually the first player chooses up, we will end up with this probability. So for the first player to choose up, the probability of the sec uh, of the column player choosing left should be at least 99.1%. So if there is at least 1% probability that the second player will choose right instead of left, then indeed for the role player choosing up is the most rational and appropriate option. So, you know, even though behavior of players when playing this game cannot be explained by Nash equilibrium in pure strategy, it can be explained by Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies. Because, again, if there is at least 1% probability that the column player will choose right instead of left, then actually the role player should choose up. And this will be like the most appropriate option. So the difference between those two games is that again in the latter game we introduce a bit of strategic uncertainty, you know. When the role player refuses to follow the idea of dominant strategy and assuming that uh, the column player will always choose left and instead introducing you know some probabilities assigned to left and right respectively okay so the second problem regarding Nash equilibrium is that rationality assumption is not enough you know to explain why we actually end up in Nash equilibrium and why we should treat this game as, and why we should treat this outcome as the solution of the game. So when we discussed uh, defining Nash equilibrium using um, a successive iteration of dominated strategies and best response analysis. So, by the way, if you do this, you will end up here at R2C2. So, when we did analysis in this way, so we discussed that Nash equilibrium is a situation when two players play their best strategies simultaneously. So, here we have this intercept. And uh, we explained that this is indeed an equilibrium because neither of the players is likely to violate from this game outcome. So for R2, it makes no sense to choose R1 or R3 or R4 as long as the role player believes that the column player will choose C2. For the column player, it makes no sense to choose C1 or C3 or C4 as long as the column player believes that the role player will stick to R2. So, the main problem with this, you know, even though we use rationality assumption to explain this behavior, is that actually, you know, we can choose any cell on uh, this payoff matrix and explain why it's an equilibrium and why it's an outcome using the same 
using the same logic you know so for instance if we choose R3 and C2 then for the role player it makes no sense it might make some sense to deviate however you know as long as the column player would stick to this strategy to C2 it might be impossible you know and if the role player indeed believes that column player would stick to this strategy so you know, just to conclude, it might be questionable. So even though Nash Equilibrium um, is used as the common game solution concept, and uh, even though, you know, we can explain why we won't deviate from Nash Equilibrium, it's hard to explain how Nash Equilibrium is a shift. I mean, in real life. So in this case, uh, rationalizability might be a solution technique which actually allows you to identify how players will achieve Nash Equilibrium. So please take a look at this game once again and please take a look at C4. So it's clear that C4 is not a dominated strategy for the column player because actually in this case if you compare C4 and C1, uh, you will see that C4 is worse if the column player, if the role player chooses R1 or R2, but it's better when the role player chooses R3. So, you know, applying the similar analysis, you can prove that C4 is not a dominated strategy. However, it's never a best response strategy. So we know that whatever the first player chooses, the column player will never ever choose C4. So th since it's not a best response strategy, we can get rid of this. Analogously for the column player, if for the role player, if the role player knows that the column player will never ever choose C4, then it makes no sense for the role player to choose R4, even though again it's not a dominated strategy. So, you know, using the same method of iteration one, over and over again, sorry, yes, you can actually end up with Nash Equilibrium of this game. So, if there is a Nash Equilibrium, rationalizability analysis, rationalizability approach will give you the same equilibrium of the equilibrium outcome of the game. If there is no Nash equilibrium, then rationalizability can actually help to, you know, predict the solution of this game, even though there might not be Nash equilibrium. Because again, in real life, we somehow end up with solution, even, even in games when um, there is no Nash equilibrium at all. Okay, I believe it will be more clear with this example. So this is Cournot Duopoly. As you remember, best response functions stand for the optimal values of Q1 for the first firm and Q2 for the second firm, depending on any level of output uh, chosen by the other firm. So please take a look. We know that for the first player, um, here is best response function of the first firm. The quantities will always take the value between 0 and B. So this just follows uh, the shape of the best response function. So the minimum of Q1 is 0, the maximum of Q1 is at point B. Analogously for the second firm, the minimum of Q2 is 0, the maximum of Q2 is C. So, again, now let's get back to the first firm. So, the first firm knows that the second firm will produce between 0 and C. So, if the second firm decides to produce 0, then the best response for the first firm will be here, B. If the second firm decides to produce C, then the best response of the first firm will be C prime here. So actually, we already narrowed the range of available quantities for the first firm from 0 to B to C prime to B. 
Analogously, the second firm knows that the first firm can produce between 0 and B units of output. So if the first firm produces uh, 0 units of output, then C is indeed the best response for the second firm. If the first firm produces B units of output, then B prime is the best response for the second firm. So here we are. We already narrowed the range of available choices from 0 to C to B prime to C. Okay, at the second round, again, the First firm knows that the second firm will produce between B prime and C. So for B prime, the best response for the second firm is B prime prime. Uh, so we narrow the choice of available quantities from C prime to B to C prime to B prime prime. And if the first firm produces between C prime and B in this round, then actually for the second firm the optimal strategy the optimal response to c prime is c prime prime so here we narrow the range of available quantities for the second firm from b prime c to b prime c prime prime so we can continue, you know, the same method of thinking until we choose a round in which firms actually select Q2 star and Q1 star, which is a Nash equilibrium. So actually here, you know, we explain how rationalizability, so trying to predict uh, the strategy of the other player, you know, based on the available information and best responses can help you to achieve Nash equilibrium. So, yeah, that's it. And thank you for attention.